Hi, this is Sharon Clark with Mind the Messiah Ministries. And before I get started, please let me ask you to do a favor. Please subscribe, like, give us a thumbs up and share this with somebody. I think that they would appreciate the fact that you had done that for them. So we are on our third part of the power of taking communion. What do we see? What do we get when we take communion? What are we missing? What if there's an incredible empowerment that we are missing? What if there's an inheritance in this communion supper that we have together? What if there's power by doing it together, even though we can do it by ourselves, we can also do it together. And there's more power when we do it together. We kind of talked about that in the last uh, teaching when we talked about the word bread, meaning to battle, to war, to devour, that when we partake of the body and the bread of Messiah, that we have this ability that rises up within us, that we have the ability to fight spiritual battles and to bring down strongholds and strong men over nations and cities, that we have an ability through the power of the order of milk which is a priestly order that Yeshua, Jesus, operates in the heavenlies under. And we learned all that in the last teaching that was under um, the Lord's Supper. Was it um, a Passover meal? That's the first one. And the second one is called What If? And that's the power of communion. Please go back and look at those if you haven't seen them. This is the third part, and it is as vitally as important. I don't want you to miss this because this is something that many of us have never seen at all. Some of you may have seen the power of the ordination in that order of Melchizedek given to the apostles and disciples in that room when they had the Last Supper. Many of you didn't, and it was new to you. So this part is even stronger. For those of you that don't know that the Bible has many different kinds of covenants, again, I have a teaching, several, 14 of them, I think, on this YouTube channel about covenant and all the things that happen with covenant, the blood covenants, the threshold covenant, the sandal covenant, the salt covenant, that all of them are explained in the different teachings on this channel. So please go back and take a look at them. Today, what we're going to look at is something called the Sandal Covenant. And most of it totally missed that when we saw it at the Lord's Supper. So that's where I'm going to begin today. So what else happened at the Lord's Supper that maybe we missed? What if we missed a very important part of it? Jesus washed the disciples' feet. I think we all know that. All of us that are Christians that have partaken of this meal, we even have been in churches, our congregations, our Bible studies where we've washed each other's feet and still didn't understand what it was we were doing. So Jesus does not impart his inheritance to servants, he gives it to sons. And what happens here is these disciples are no longer servants, but they have become sons. They are willing to lay down their life for the kingdom. So this is what happened. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. There's a covenant in the scriptures called the Sandal Covenant. It was always part of the marriage betrothal ceremony. So if you ever look at the Hebrew marriage betrothal ceremony, you will see the sandal covenant, and that is called the covenant of inheritance. So the salt covenant represents friendship, and the sandal covenant, that represents inheritance. Biblically and historically, shoes depict ownership. Taking off the shoe established a profound covenantal relationship. And we see this practice in other faiths as well. People took off their shoes when entering a sacred place. The Levitical priests did not wear shoes in the temple. They were on holy ground. Moses and Joshua were both instructed to remove their shoes when they came into the presence of God. Then we see the removal of shoes in the story of Ruth, where Boaz, which is her kinsman redeemer, he's come to redeem her. Any transfer of property or inheritance required the removal of shoes. And that's so far from our Western customs, we don't understand that at all. But that was a custom in the ancient rituals. So shoes and sandals were important symbolic articles for ancient and modern Israel as well. 
And this is called the Ceremony of the Shoe. If you want more information on this, you can actually look that up, the Ceremony of the Shoe. The transfer of property in ancient times was accompanied by a rite or a ritual consisting primarily of removing the shoes. The Hebrews called it halitza, H-A-L-I-T-Z-A-H, which meant to draw off. When someone sold his property, he loses permanently his right or his legal right to that property. So he lifts up his foot from off it and he places the foot of the new owner on it. If you remember in Genesis 13, 17, after Lot leaves Abram, God shows him all the land that he will inherit. He is given instruction from God to arise. So Genesis 13, 17 says this, when God speaks to Abraham and shows him what he's going to inherit, arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. So how does Abraham begin to claim his land? By putting his shoes on the land as the new owner of it. He is told to walk every part of it. The biblical traditions took a further step. So these are some of the historical understandings, but now we're going to look at biblical steps that take it even further. The lifting up of the foot became more concrete and real with the pulling off of the shoe. The act of witnesses was a legal binding act to show that the person was relinquishing his right of a particular piece of property willingly and had formally, formally and officially let go of all future claims to that particular piece of property. The removal of the sandal signified that the transaction was complete. Think about that. The removal of a sandal indicated it was significant and it meant the transaction was complete and the ritual was legally binding. Our commentary or one commentary that I, I came across said it this way, a person's garments are so to speak part of himself. If a person removes his garments in order to show his willingness to deprive himself of everything in this life, then he ought also to remove his shoes. It took at least 10 elders to witness and to confirm the final taking off of shoes. There were that many that night that were present at the Lord's Supper. It was used for transferring property and domain or dominion. So the taking off of the shoe was used to transfer dominion. Used to transfer dominion. Adam gave up his dominion to a kingdom. Adam didn't lose a garden. He lost a kingdom. He was placed and had dominion over the kingdom of God on this earth. He lost a kingdom. Jesus came back to reestablish that kingdom. Or Jesus came to reestablish that kingdom. He will come back and rule and reign here on this earth. So Jesus is transferring his dominion at the Lord's Supper to the disciples. And here's a quote. The shoes was a natural symbol of possession. The removal of the same implied divestment, that they were letting go of something. This act had binding legal implications clearly understood by all who were called upon to witness the right. Many people did not read or write, but this allowed people to become witnesses to a legal transaction. Scholars believe that the right was at one time very widespread in the ancient Near East. The one removing the shoe was renouncing a right, giving up a right, and it had to be done of your free will. When the Levitical priest entered the temple, he gave up his right 
to his personal life. He removed his street clothes and shoes, and he put on garments to serve God and him alone. Removal of shoes is a renunciation of this world and its ways, exchanging them for a spiritual residence. Think about this. Think about the implications of this. It is setting aside the natural man and the things of this fallen world in order to consecrate one's life and embrace the things of God, including his presence, his glory, and his spirit. Shoes are necessary only on this earth because of the filth of the ground. By removing them, we symbolically leave this world. Jesus asked the disciples to take off their sandals. He washed their feet. Washing was symbolic of consecration and was necessary for the worshiper to wash his garments before taking part in any sacred function. Because of the material shoes were made of, they couldn't be washed, and they were removed as an act of consecration. So listen to me. Shoes are removed as an act of consecration. When we enter into the presence of the Lord, we are divesting ourselves of this world. We're leaving the world behind. We're coming into the presence of God. We're leaving the world behind. So the Hebrew word for sandal is na'al, N-A-A-L. It's a word play with N-A-H-A-L, meaning inheritance. When we willingly divest ourselves from this world or let go of this world, Yeshua fulfills his promises to give us our inheritance that we will inherit the land. Removal of the shoe is a ritualistic way of exhibiting faith in our bridegroom and his ability to save and to redeem. When we enter into covenant with Yeshua, the bridegroom, we offer him our shoes as a representation that we have given up all that we have because we trust him and all that he has promised to do for us and to give to us. At the Last Supper, the disciples move from being servants to being sons. Servants do not inherit the land. Sons do. We are the children of God. We are children of the King. Get this. You are no longer a servant, but a son. You are in line to inherit the kingdom. John 1 well, says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them, I believe on his name. Every one of those disciples were willing to lay down their life, to give up everything to inherit the kingdom of God. Peter was reluctant at first to remove his shoes. But when Jesus said, either you do that or you have no part of me, Peter said, then wash me all. Why was it so important that Peter remove his shoes? Because this was the passing of the inheritance to begin to walk and to move in the same authority that Christ himself walked in. It was an invitation for them to function under a new order, not under the Levitical priesthood, but under the lordship in the heavenlies, the order of Melchizedek. This is who we are. We are to be willing to love not our lives unto death. And when we do that, we're going to walk in the authority and the power of the king. We are king's kids. We are royalty. We have access to the throne at any time through Yeshua, not once a year, but moment by moment, day by day, 24-7. Removing the shoes was always the last thing that was done at the end of a transaction, and it had to have at least 10 witnesses. At the Lord's Supper, the sandals were removed, and the feet were washed at the end of this covenantal meal. It was the last thing they did before they went out. The disciples were willing 
to let go of this earthly kingdom and to seal the transaction by removing their shoes. According to historians, it would have been very common knowledge for the disciples to know what it meant to remove their shoes. Jesus tells Peter, I know you don't understand all what this means right now, but you will. He didn't understand then. We don't understand, but we will. Jesus wants us to begin to understand. He passed an inheritance to us. In Israel, land boundaries were marked with sandals, and it was totally illegal to remove them. When Israel marched around the desert, they drew lines or they carved lines around their sandals in the stone to depict the promise that God had given them the land. That everywhere that they placed their foots that have been given to them. So the question is, next time that you take communion, will you be ready to remove your sandals? Are you committed to leave this world behind? To lay it down and to lay down your life and to embrace the kingdom of God and that alone? So now there's one more point that I need to make about the partaking of the communion. So that I just asked you. That's That needs some thinking. When you take communion, are you laying down your life? Do we realize what we're doing? Do we realize the agreement that we're coming into with Yeshua when we partake of the emblems of the blood and the, and the body? Here's one more aspect. Jesus said to them something very strange and weird, and it made some people go back. They, they quit following him after this. This is John 6, 53. And Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. I mean, you're just not alive. You have no life. You have no spiritual life in you. Whosoever eats of my flesh and drinks my blood, he has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. That's what's real. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Him and you, you and him. In exchange. Just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. He is the word. We are to feed on him. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna, but they died. But whosoever feeds on this bread will live forever. As strange as this sounds to us, Jesus knew that many cultures of the world had eaten human flesh and drank human blood for centuries. And this is from the Medical News Today website. Because people are still doing this. They're still eating human flesh. It says in some cultures, once a person died... Their loved ones consumed parts of their body so that they, quite literally, became part of them. That's what they believed. To Western minds, it might seem disturbing. But to those who entertain these rituals, burying your mother in the dirt and leaving her to be entirely consumed by maggots is equally as disturbing to them. Well, here's another quote from Vox, VOX.com. There are many horrifying examples of cannibalism in Europe throughout history. But one of the most bizarre is that cannibalism was occasionally seen as a remedy. To pick one example, in Germany, from the 1600s to the 1800s, executioners often had a bizarre side job that supplemented their income selling leftover body parts as medicine. Human fat was sold as a remedy for broken bones and sprains and arthritis. So other reasons for cannibalism were to become stronger, faster. If they desired the strength or the ability of an enemy, they would eat 
the heart of their enemy, or the flesh from their enemy. The occult believes that eating human flesh keeps them young. If this person was demon-possessed, a demon-possessed person, they consume their flesh to gain satanic powers because they want their power plus the power that the dead person carried. In war, eating the enemy is to perform an extreme form of physical dominance. There are others that believe a dead person did not go to the spirit world until the fourth day after death. And so eating them before that time kept them from being used in the spirit world against them. They didn't want them to come back and be used against them, so they ate them. There is the belief, if you consume your enemy, you gain his power and his force. And it's added to what you already have. So that's enough of the gory stuff. So this is what Jesus has done for you and me. In setting for us at the communion table, the bread and the wine, he has permitted us to partake of him in the same manner by, by using emblems, symbols, the bread and the wine. We are not cannibals. However, we can symbolically and spiritually partake of the flesh of Yeshua. We then receive all that he is. We receive his healing, his power, his anointing. We become one with him and we recognize that our strength is little, but his is great within us. We symbolically drink the blood, understanding what he poured out for us, the sacrifice that he made for us. Like the warriors that kill the lion and eat his heart to gain its courage, so we symbolically partake of Messiah himself. He allows us to have all the attributes of his love, his nature, by partaking of him and becoming one with him. When your heart is right, you will know who you are in Christ Jesus. You will inherit his legacy, his very attributes through the sandal covenant. You will move from being servants to being sons and ready to receive your inheritance. You will covenant with him to begin to walk in your calling under the authority of Melchizedek and under his priesthood where signs and wonders are commonplace, where the gifts of the Spirit flow freely, where you cast out demons with the finger of God. You are a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood. You are the offspring of a king. We have an inheritance and we have to rise up and take what has already been bequeathed to us. Yeshua has come with a covenant meal for us. He offered us bread and wine, and we are no longer bound by an earthly Levitical priesthood, but we are the star seed of Abraham, and we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. It's time for the violent to take the kingdom of God by force to take control of our land, our lives, and our children, to take back what the devil has stolen from us, and for us to realize all that happened at the Last Supper was done for us. It's done for you and me. These men took off their shoes that night that turned their backs on the world for the things of God, walked in power that the world had never seen before. Why not here? Why not now? Why are we not walking in this? Why don't we understand this? I pray every time that you partake of the communion elements, that you will surrender all, everything of this world, that you'll take on who he is. Give him who you are. 
that your confidence and what this ordinance means to you will boost your ability to be demon slayers and world overcomers. He's calling us up higher. Will you respond? Will you step into greatness? Are you one who's willing and willingly able to function in the kingly priestly role? Yeshua, Jesus, is reigning as a king, prophet, and priest. And he desires to bring his kingdom to this earth. He wants no boundaries between him and his covenant people. He came to restore the kingdom that the first Adam lost. He said, that kingdom is within you. I will end with this, Luke 12, 31 and 32. But seek the kingdom of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And all these things will be added to you. Whenever you seek him, everything else comes to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It delights the Father to give you the kingdom of God. Remember, you are not just called to be a nation of priests, but you are called of a royal line. The blood of the king is running through your veins. What do you think? What if there is extreme empowerment in the communion of an until meal. And what if God's way of calling us up higher, what if part of it is taking this meal with greater understanding? So I challenge you, what will you do with what you've learned today? I pray you will come back and listen to this over and over until you get it down in your spirit. So I'm going to give you some declarations to finish this up with. We're going to say this together. I am a child of God. I declare that I am sold out. I walk in my inherited role. I declare that my life has no hold on me. This world has no hold on me and that my life is hid with Christ in God. That I am seated in heavenly places. If we will do all that we've learned here today, we'll see signs and wonders and the power of God in this generation. And it is not too late. It is not as long as we have breath. We can see the power of God move the way that we've always wanted to see it. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on this earth. Just like it is in heaven. When we say, give us this day our daily bread, you know what that is? That's Yeshua. It's partaking of the bread and the wine. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our daily allotment of our walk with you, Father, with Jesus. I so hope that you have grasped this and that some of this made sense to you. Again, please give us a thumbs up, a share, a like, and do subscribe. We appreciate it. I pray God will bless you and that very soon you will have an opportunity to take communion with the body. And as you do that, that you will, in your mind, together, join together, partaking of bread that allows you to battle and overcome for the kingdom of God on this earth. Yahweh bless you. We'll see you next time.